When Louis was alive, pale skin, full hair, and trained calves were all the rage. The Sun King was considered utterly handsome and he was quite manly, but the title of most handsome in France was long held by the Comte de Guiche, who was more elegant, and afterwards by the Chevalier de Lorraine, whose face was a little more soft in his youth. If you're new to my channel, welcome. In this video, we're going to transform Louis XIV's portrait from young to old to see how he might have looked in real life, as well as talk about what his deal was. Here on Mortal Faces, I recreate historic portraits using my Photoshop skills to see how individuals we read about might have looked in real life, and I also entangle family trees. Up, subscribe for more historic recreations, and let me know in the comments who you want to see in upcoming videos. What did not change, and is as incredibly attractive today as it was back then, is a fast and quick mind. The French call it esprit, the English wit, and it means a mental sharpness and inventiveness, a natural aptitude for using words and ideas in a quick and inventive way to create humor, and that's what Louis had. After 23 years and four stillbirths in 1638, Louis was born to the French king Louis XIII and Anne of Austria. He was the eldest of two. His younger brother would be the Duc d'Orléans. As a result, he was considered a divine gift from God. Extremely close to his mother, she instilled him a sense of divineness and continued the tradition of the absolute monarchy. You see, his father, Louis XIII, established the absolute monarchy, but there were still a lot of improvements to be made to limit the power of the nobility, which this power posed a threat. As much as Louis XIV loved art, he was himself an artist at the political game. In his later years, he would beautify the absolute monarchy by rearranging prerogatives for the nobility, but let's begin at his early life. Louis grew up with his mother, who fought for sole control of his regency, and it was a time when the nobility still had a means to raise armies and build fortifications. There were remnants of feudalism still left in the political system that needed to be ironed away, so his mother groomed Louis to think of himself as a being from God who had complete authority over everyone. One way Anne did this was by establishing an iron fist and imprisoning any aristocrat or member of parliament who challenged her will. Her main aim was to transfer to her son the absolute authority in matters of finance and justice. So she thought for him to have authority, he needs to be given authority from her. Therefore, she needs to achieve authority herself. And she did that by the Iron Fist. As a young age, he loved food, theater, and ballet, and this would be his captivation as he entered adulthood. But there was a darkness to his childhood too. You see, his mother, with the help of her political partner, Cardinal Mazarin, were too radical at times, and this led to the outbreak called the Fronde, or the French Civil War, which was characterized by the nobility's stripping of various powers, such as the demotion from a vassal to a mere courtier. But it was scary. He was just a kid, and he was forced to take on the confidence of political matters from his mother and Mazarin, which he barely understood. The family home became at times a near prison when Paris had to be abandoned, the royal family were driven out of Paris twice, and other times they were held under virtual house arrest in the city. However, at the end, the king and his mother eventually won, but the Frondiers, aged 10 to 15, planted in Louis a hatred of this ancient city and a consequent determination to move out of the capital as soon as possible, never to return, and we'll see this with Versailles. Early in his love life, he fell in love with Marie Mancini, Mazarin's niece, but his mother disapproved. Much like her, who was a second cousin to her husband, Louis XIII, she wanted her son to marry the daughter of her brother, his first cousin, Princess Maria Therese of Spain. Oh, Louis cried, but all his tears did not dissuade her from her goals. This marriage would end the war with France and Spain. Furthermore, with the uneasiness of the Spanish heirs, it just might, and it did, eventually deliver the Spanish throne to the House of Bourbon, which continues to this day. When he was 13 in 1651, he reached age of majority, and when Mazarin died 10 years later in 1661, he reigned with full control without any chief ministers. 
He said, Up to this moment, I have been pleased to entrust the government of my affairs to the late cardinal. It is now time that I govern them myself. You will assist me with your counsels when I ask for them. I request and order you to seal no orders except by my command. I order you not to sign anything, not even a passport, without my command, to render account to me personally each day and to favor no one. At this point in his 20s, the public wanted peace after years of civil and foreign wars, and Louis was able to capitalize on that. France's treasury verged on bankruptcy because of inefficient tax systems and corrupt middlemen, so he fired and hired new people and created new positions. He reduced debt by having a more efficient taxation, which resulted in flipping the debt into a surplus in only five years. For the next 20 years, Louis was strategically taking France's influence globally. From the New World to Morocco, even Siam and China, his influence was growing and by the 1680s, when he was around 40, he was at the height of his power. But he never forgot the trauma of the fraud years, and this gave him an idea which turned into his most popular tactic known today as upgrading his father's old hunting lodge into a palace, Versailles. It took 20 years, and in 1682, he moved the court to Versailles, which took a few more years until 1687, when people fully recognized Versailles as the seat of power, but this was his mark, and he made it happen. Versailles. It was supposed to be like the heavens where the divine sun king lived. What was so smart about this move was in order to finalize the removal of the nobility's threatening power, he had to focus their attention on something else, and Versailles was just that. Apartments were built to house those willing to pay court to the king. However, the pensions and privileges necessary to live in a style appropriate to their rank were only possible by waiting constantly on Louis. For this purpose, an elaborate court ritual was created wherein the king became the center of attention and was observed throughout the day by the public. With his excellent memory, Louis could then see who attended him at court and who was absent, facilitating the subsequent distribution of favors and positions. Moreover, by entertaining, impressing, and domesticating them with extravagant luxury and other distractions, Louis not only cultivated public opinion of himself, but he also ensured the aristocracy remained under his scrutiny. They were his chickens, and he was the keeper. Basically, the entire thing was a big elaborate trap, and those who were obsessed with being a peacock got sucked into his world of Barbie Versailles edition. On the outside, it looked all gilded and golden, but on the inside, it was super expensive. You had to pay for your own apartment and clothing. Nothing was given to you for free. You had to keep wearing the most updated wardrobe and jewelry all the while trying to maintain your own estates elsewhere. It was a huge financial drain on the nobles who chose to live in Versailles, but it was the only way to gain a lot of favor and keep out of disgrace. It was an investment, but just like any, the cost was sometimes too high for certain people, and as a result, they got into heavy debt. So you're not only left impoverished, but also embarrassed, because you're constantly surrounded by more successful winners. It was very, very competitive, and if you were more introverted, this was not a place for you. The higher up you were in the social ladder, the greater expectations you had to maintain your position. Each day at court was strictly codified, as Madame Palatine explains in a letter to her Aunt Sophie from 1676. First, I went to Versailles, where we were kept busy all day. We hunted from morning until 3 in the afternoon. Upon returning from the hunt, we changed clothes and went up to play, remaining there until 7 in the evening. Then we went to the theater, which did not finish until half past ten. After the theater, we took supper. After supper, it was time for the ball, which went on until three in the morning, and only then did we retire to bed. But that was the genius of it all. It was a work of art that Louis created. He perfected this little world on how to keep his potential enemies from having idle hands by giving them ambition and reason to swoon over him. Their greed was his gain. 
Louis throughout his life kept being intrigued by everything art, theater, science, and war. He never stopped learning, which is a quality that great leaders often possess. He was a strong leader, and this made France a contender in the global powerhouses. His strength would unfortunately filter away, though, as his descendants got the throne, resulting in the French Revolution 90 years later. He had about 21 children with around six mistresses and two wives, and the only one who would inherit the crown would be his great-grandson, Louis XV. Louis died in 1715, age 76, and his reign was the longest of any sovereign in verifiable history, 72 years. And that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more videos. Each of your subscriptions has helped this channel grow. It allows me to continue making more content for you. Let me know in the comments who you want to see next. I do make a list of all your suggestions, and I will see you in the next one.